All right, so I am going to share my screen as we get ready to talk about team-based learning. Okay, um, so just like other kinds of, of pedagogies, include, including project-based learning, um, team-based learning is the kind of thing where there's official definitions and then there's probably lots of people who say, they do it and they mean different things than, than this. So um, today we're gonna be looking at team-based learning, um, the way it's more formally defined in the educational literature um, and the way that you use it, you know, may not conform to all of these exact specifications, which is fine. So I'm gonna start with a couple of specific definitions. Um, Michael Sweet's definition, which tends to be in use in a lot of places, a special form of collaborative learning using a specific sequence of individual work, group work, and immediate feedback to create a motivational framework in which students increasingly hold each other accountable for coming to class prepared and contributing to discussion. So one of the things to note in this is that it's one of the ways that some faculty use um, to assure active participation by students, that it decreases the amount of time that students would come to class um, not ready because the framework of team-based learning sort of requires certain things in order to have student participation. Um, in terms of looking a little bit more specifically at the, um, at the parts of team-based learning, um, a strategy that provides students with opportunities to apply conceptual knowledge through a sequence of events that includes individual work, teamwork, and immediate feedback. So the basic gist um, of team-based learning is that you're, it's a little bit of a flipped classroom model that you're obviously familiar with. Um, so in team-based learning, they do the initial knowledge acquisition. They, they interact with the content before class, and then class is used for the team-based learning, which is flipped because in a very traditional classroom, you would deliver the content transmission. You would have that happen during lecture, and then you would ask them to apply their knowledge after the, um, the class. So that's why we sometimes refer to this as one of the flipped classroom models. Um, but I also just wanted to quickly, because uh, project-based learning or PBL, and these are called DBL and PBL, um, project-based learning is one of the pedagogies defined in cluster learning. I thought it'd be helpful to take a look at how project-based learning and team-based learning are similar and different. So here's a definition for, for project-based learning, a teaching method in which students gain knowledge and skills by working for an extended period of time to investigate and respond to an authentic, engaging, and complex question problem or challenge. So there's some things that are similar here, right? Students are working in teams and they've got a challenge in front of them that they're working on, but there's also some really big differences between TBL and PBL. Um, the, the biggest one is what we call um, the dessert and main meal issue. And this is one of the things we talk about a lot in the collab. It comes from the Buck Institute um, that does a lot of work with project-based learning. And they talk about project-based learning as, um, as opposed to doing a project after students learn the content where the project would be like the dessert, right? You learn the content then you go do a project to apply it. With project-based learning, the content is the main meal. So you are learning the content through the project. So that's different than like doing a project in your class. Project-based learning is really um, interested in having students learn the content through the project. It's a little bit like a video game model where generally students don't study how to play the video game first and then go play it. They learn how to play the video game by playing it. And that's how project-based learning um, generally works. So if we go back to this um, little graph here and you think about project-based learning, um, for project-based learning, the knowledge acquisition and the content transmission and the application, everything happens during class time, right? That's all together. So there's nothing before and nothing after. The project is the whole thing. So I think it's important when we talk about PBL and TBL to try 
um, to see how they align, that sort of team-based stuff, the idea of a challenge or a problem, and then how they're very different. Project-based learning tends to be much more student-directed with the content being learned by students in the projects as they go. So let's go back to TBL um, briefly, and there's some paradigm shifts. Um, I'm gonna give you all of the citations for this and the slide deck afterwards, so you don't need to like take notes or screenshots or anything. Yeah, um, so you'll, you'll get the whole thing. Um, so like this one's from UBC, but there's lots of great um, places to go to find things. So you'll get that in the slide deck. Um, but some of the paradigm shifts I think are really cool in terms of the sorts of pedagogies that we love at Plymouth State, where we talk about active learning and really engaging with our students. And that I know particularly in places like DPT and in nursing, we're very um, hands-on programs, right? So, and I know because I am like the biggest champion of the lab um, because you fixed my hip. So thank you, DPT people. Um, I did not have to have uh, labrum repair surgery because of my great PT. So a lot of this is in keeping with that kind of dynamic hands-on learning, right? Um, the goal is not just to know things, but to be able to apply things. We have more of a, a guide on the side rather than a sage on the stage relationship for teachers, which is something you guys I think are very familiar with. Students move from passive to active learning and students become um, more responsible for their learning in these models. Um, so here are some of the design principles. Again, you know, you may choose to adopt some or all of these. These are, this is from like very formal um, TBL learning design um, uh, rubrics. And, you know, obviously professors will do with it what they want. In general, um, for TBL to be most effective, uh, they suggest large teams and, you know, largest in quotes, by that they mean five to seven students. Um, and they like those teams to stay permanent. And whether that means, you know, through the course of um, one challenge or for the semester is up to you, but they don't do a lot of mixing around um, as the teams are working because a lot depends on those relationships. Um, there's accountability for students to be prepared Students make complex decisions and there's frequent and timely feedback. So we'll look at how this works in the TBL models. We're not gonna go through this whole graph, but I wanted you to have it in the slide deck. Really the three parts of TBL tend to be preparation, usually pre, like we looked at that graph, pre-class preparation, then readiness, readiness assurance. And sometimes this is called readiness, readiness assurance tests. Um, and this is very different than the project-based learning model where there's no readiness assurance, right? You're not ready. You just go into the project and you become ready as you are learning. Um, but in order to take on the project in um, team-based learning, you have to pass a series of tests first to show um, that you are prepared for the project that you're going to have. Um, and then the application-focused activity, which we tend to think of as the place where the team really starts working. So this is what those pieces look like in TBL. For pre-class preparation, you know, all the standard things. Usually there'd be maybe a reading assignment, you're watching a video, you've got your content in Canvas or in your textbooks or wherever. Um, and the groups should be formed ahead of time so that when you come into class, um, you are all ready. A few things about the groups. Um, Groups generally are all working on the same uh, prob uh, problem and all of the timing is kept simultaneous. So that's also different than project-based learning where different groups are moving at different speeds because they might be handling different parts of a problem. So like in tackling a wicked problem when they're doing food insecurity challenges, all of the groups may have a different aspect of food insecurity that they're working on, and therefore the projects are ebbing and flowing at different rates. But TBL takes a lot more synchronicity from the professor to manage those groups all working um, on a more formal timeline. Um, after the pre-class prep, you have the readiness assurance tests, and they actually use these little um, uh, uh, acronyms, IRAT and GRAT. 
um, individual readiness assurance tests and group readiness assurance tests. So these are very simple, generally multiple choice tests, and usually they're administered first on an individual level, um, and students are required to pass those um, individual tests before they're allowed to um, participate with their group. So this would basically mirror the content that they would have. Students would know ahead of time that these were coming. They would not be pop quizzes. They would know what was going to be on them um, and they would know they would have to demonstrate this, this stuff. Um, usually after they pass, and, and you can do pieces of this. So for example, maybe you don't have an individual readiness test, just a group readiness test. But one of the ideas in TBL is that it works better if every student comes with a level playing field. So there isn't one person in the group you know, who didn't do the work, who can now catch up in the, in the project. So you try to get everybody through that individual test. The group readiness test can work a little differently. Um, these are, they can, they can either be some of the same um, things, but instead of getting say like a 75% on your individual test, you have to get 100% as a group or they could be more complex questions, um, sort of higher, higher level things that students can work together on. And then the key is that after the group readiness test, the groups get um, instructor feedback immediately. Um, and if any group doesn't pass that, they can continue to work um, and kind of make an appeal that they go back. This might include some mini lecturing from the instructor. Basically what you're doing is you're looking for the gaps in student knowledge. And instead of delivering a whole lecture on you know, the labrum tear, um, you are just giving the lecture on the parts of the labrum tear that really confused folks. So um, it's a little bit more of on the fly lecturing designed to meet their um, needs. You can, you'll you can understand why this takes some planning because you'll have to figure out, am I gonna do that? rotating through the groups. And that's kind of how I think I would used to do this when I would do things that were similar is I would go to the group, I would see their, their, their grat, and I would say, okay, this is good. But on number four, you might want to think a little bit about, and I would just talk to them for a couple of minutes, get them up to speed. So that all of this kind of takes a little bit of a dance, right, to kind of figure that out. Um, and that's when you move to phase three, which is really the, the project or the challenge that you've got for your group. Um, these are some of the ways that we can set up those challenges, but I think a better um, resource had those application things set up by thinking about the four S's. So first of all, the, pro the problems that they're working on should be significant. These aren't little yes or no things. Um, and this is the kind of stuff I think particularly in nursing and DPT, you understand, because these might be a clinical challenge, um, working on a um, you know, particular PT um, diagnosis and how would you run through this, that kind of thing. All the teams working on the same problem, there should be choices along the way. So the problem is better if it doesn't have only one correct mode through it. Um, so just like in a clinical setting, right, there's always going to be a number of choices you can make um, or different orders in which you can do things. So you want it to be in that sense a little bit complex. So it allows the team to navigate it. Um, and that when the, the stuff is over, um, there is simultaneously re reporting. So what you don't want is one team revealing what they did while another team is still in process. So the idea is that you have that kind of reporting back happen as a class um, all together so that people can then pool their resources. So when re uh, researchers, particularly in the health sciences, um, studied team-based learning for learning outcomes, there are some pretty, um, pretty excellent results. Um, so first of all, over on the right-hand side, Students using team-based learning met course objectives with fewer lectures. Now, that doesn't say it's better than lecturing. So, you know, lecturing is still great, but it's pretty interesting that you can cut down on the amount of content transmission that you have and still get the same amount of knowledge um, coming from your students. 
There were also re uh, improvements re reported in all of these things here over on the left, some of which are really key, I think, for things that we promise in our programs. Um, I also think things like student engagement and student satisfaction, while not necessarily always meaning that they're going to get the course outcomes. For example, I've had students who love a class, and that does not necessarily mean you know, that they're getting all of the content. In fact, students might love a class sometimes where they're really not getting the content because it's just super fun and they're not being challenged. Um, but you can see that those things all together as a group are pretty promising. Um, there's also been some other data, like here's some data where DPT students' exam scores increased when TBL was used in the program. And the researchers were kind of like, why? Like, why do you think that happened? And they don't know the answer, but in this one study, um, they were positing that because their perceptions and satisfactions towards TBL were favorable, that that kind of engagement and interest might have actually contributed to them engaging more with the content and ultimately learning it better. Um, also, because there was improved problem solving and increased knowledge retention, um, that that might have had a piece of the exam score thing too. That makes sense. We know that kind of hands-on learning um, tends to help with memory better than just that kind of rote memorization. Um, this is also, I think, one that's really important and helpful, particularly, I know, like in IDS, we see a lot of students um, who don't make it through our most rigorous programs, programs like nursing, for example. Um, so one of the questions we have is we know that folks coming into these rigorous programs are, are ready to excel, right? We don't, they're all high achieving students and they should all make it through. Um, what TBL found is that there was a decrease in variability in exam scores between the top students and the worst students. So um, what they're saying is that particularly for students who are a little bit more on the line and perhaps less likely to succeed, those students are improving um, because of the team-based work. And that seems maybe very challenging where programs have very big gaps, right? Because then one of the things you worry is, are you gonna bring your top students down if they're always caring for the students who are, who are struggling? But when we already know that our students are high achievers and, um, and ready to excel, then decreasing that gap is really good news, I think. So I think that's another real benefit of TBL. So I don't have much more. I have 12 tips for facilitation that I think you can look at later um, that come from people who do a lot of, of TBL kind of suggesting if you want to try this or improve how you do at it, um, here are some things to think about. But particularly for the recording, I thought we might just have you guys kind of unmute and talk a little bit about have you done team-based learning in these formal ways before? If so, what's worked or not worked for you, or what are you looking forward to, to trying? Um, and I thought if we did just five minutes of that, then I could let you folks go at, uh, at 8.30 and we'd have a nice little resource to, to share with others. So um, just wondering if anybody has any feedback, any thoughts or any experience with the stuff that you might wanna share. Well, since I requested it, I'll jump in. <laughs> um, we had, um, I think several years ago, a few of us from the program that I was in in Connecticut went to an educational leadership conference for the APTA, which is held once a year. And there was several presentations on TBL. It had just started to come into, um, you know, being introduced into a lot of DPT programs. And so we, um, a few of us kind of jumped on board and I had a colleague and, and I who worked really hard to implement it in our neuroscience, neuropathology course. Um, and we did find uh, that it worked incredibly well and that student learning and retention was markedly improved. I think the, the satisfaction pieces were a little tricky. The students were very engaged during class, um, but they were also pretty frustrated with the transition from being very passive learners to being required to jump in at that really high challenging activity level. Um, and although we could see 
the benefit, they didn't always see that themselves. And then their, their perception when we were not standing up in front of the room and lecturing, which we were already trying to get away from doing, was that we were not teaching. Um, because, you know, yet there's a ton of work that goes into preparing and all the, the, the materials and, and really figuring out what that activity is going to be, making sure it's challenging enough, but not too challenging, and how much time is everything going to, I mean, it's really hard to prepare all the stuff and have it run um, relatively smoothly, and it takes a lot of time for them to process the activities, but their perception was that we weren't teaching um, because they were doing all the work. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that you said that because we certainly hear that, I think probably times 10 with PBL because it, and, and students get hit with that in tackling a wicked problem when they first show up um, and they don't even get that free content, right? They're learning. And so they're saying, what are we, what are we paying you for? <laughs> you know, why are we here? And I think one thing I think about when you say that is, um, you know, most pe most, you know, consumers in, in educational markets, whether that be parents or students themselves, will say they want active learning, they want hands on, they want, you know, and then, of course, because students are trained to be passive and compliant, in general, it's very uncomfortable when they're asked to do those things. I think if Plymouth State continues to make an effort to have these pedagogies be more institutional, really advertised, really what set us apart, it would help a little bit with the kind of surprise factor where students are like, this isn't what we signed up for. You know, we signed up to, to be taught this material. Um, but I, I think, you know, you're definitely talking about a common challenge that we hear from a lot of people when they're transitioning to this kind of pedagogy. Um, Stephanie, did you wanna jump in? Oh, I was just um, sort of similar to what Barb was saying is we now have a, a new group coming through our PCM series and with the continuity in the program now, like they were prepped second semester of like case-based learning. You come to class, you sort of have your ticket to class where they have to submit assignments based on the critical thinking that we're going to be doing that day and there's pre-class requirements and they know like if they don't if they don't submit that and they're not ready to actively participate in class like they're not going to be part of the discussion that day and it's just it's it was a lot easier there was a lot less resistance this semester than I've seen in previous ones um, and it's great I'm like listening to this presentation going yeah yeah no we're doing that in class today they just submitted their scripts and we're having these clinical discussions and I'm guiding not lecturing and there's no so yeah but it's very much that transition um, has been easier yeah go ahead Edie um so I had the opportunity to work on an actual structured TBL um project part of the the APTEC so that our pediatric section um, our annual conference, there used to be a compulsory session that was the TBL that everybody at the conference, like a thousand people would um, would attend in various different rooms. Um, and I started off just being a room facilitator and then actually got to work on the team that developed the project, the, the case. It was a case based. Um, it was kind of cool because um, so everybody there was a pediatric physical therapist, but what we do is start at the room and have um, like the early intervention people, the NICU people, the school based people, the outpatient people, and then make sure that each group, each team had somebody from each kind of area. And then the case went through NICU all the way through adulthood. Like so different team members got to be the expert kind of at different phases of the project. And we kind of got away. You can't do pre-work with that many people coming for a conference because half of them don't even know their schedule when they show up. So um, we still did the IRATs. The, um, most of the session um, was based on different stages in the case. And then we do a T-RAT afterwards. But um, that so it was kind of like their life was the pre-work sorta and we published the case ahead of time and had some some articles ahead of time but you know nobody would actually read them um, i like the idea of their life though and i can see that in 
also potentially in interdisciplinary teams, having the pre-work be, you know, bring your focus, bring your lens um, mm -hmm. to bear. But we um, had, we used a very structured, like we used um, scantrons for the t -ray. We used cards where they'd hold up. We had specific discussion sessions. And then as we prepared the case, you know, we had multiple choice questions that were somewhat ambiguous in some way. And we did that purposefully. So that would foster discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and then we had evidence that would back up the right answer, but maybe some evidence that would kind of hint at the other answer. And so that, that definitely opened it up um, to discussion really well. But I was going to say, um, we got such a biphasic response to the after feedback. There were some people that really liked it, that enjoyed it. That was the bulk of the people, but the people that didn't hated it, like death threats almost, right. like hated it. And That's these are professionals. Yeah. And it's interesting to kind of probe that to, to think about, you know, students, you know, disabilities, introversion, all sorts of different things that can, can relate. And one of the things I really like that you point out, though, is that um, one of the big differences with project-based learning is that team-based learning, it's not such a big deal for us at Plymouth State, but it's known for um, being something you can implement in very, very large classes. Um, and what that, what that means is just figuring out that um, immediate feedback part, which that immediate feedback loop is really important to those pre-assessments, but you can figure that out in a whole bunch of different ways. One of the things I like about the model you just talked about too was the using of you know mentors or um, even thinking about teaching assistants or older students um, as some of the people who can provide that immediate feedback, especially in a larger in a larger group where you can't necessarily be be doing that. Um, I'd love to see some of that happen, even just in our gen ed classes where we might get some people coming back in to kind of. Um, because you know, one of the big, pro not problems, but there's just a lot of orchestration you know, that happens here um, and, and a lot of architecture that happens here. So it's nice to have you know, just those co-pilots with you, um, especially if you have a larger group. But I think it's, it's really great stuff. And the, the question of how we move from what in education, we usually call that banking model um, of education, which is where you make a deposit into a student's brain, right? The, the banking model transitioning to what, what um, Frera called a problem posing model. And this is a classic move from the old banking model to the problem posing model. And one of the things is students, small number of them love it, larger number of them don't like it. And then an even larger number are like, what am I supposed to do with this, right? So. Um, figuring out what that prep work looks like, maybe even institutionally, I think would be would be helpful. Everything from how we set up our PR materials to how we build our first year seminars and our composition classes and our math, you know, introductory classes to how we do our intro to the major courses to how we represent our and distinguish our graduate programs. So, really great, great stuff. Um, before I end and I'll, I'll leave and let Barb do whatever she needs to do or the rest of you have a chat. Uh, is there any other final comments or experiences people wanna share for posterity on the recording? I would just share one thing if I could, Robin, which is that um, in a couple of people addressed this earlier on, I think where you know, you're trying something that, when you try things that are outside of what people typically think of as education, right? That passive learning where you go and you sit in a classroom and somebody lectures to you and, you know, then everybody feels like they're getting their money's worth and, and uh, that's it. Um, I, I think it's, you know, part of that is getting people to um, appreciate and value. And maybe part of that is on the, the instructor to make that explicit at the beginning about why they're using that certain type of approach. But the other thing I would say is that, you know, in trying to think about, we talk in, in the collab. I love coming to collab stuff. I come all the time, but uh, sometimes I really struggle with being able to move from some of these teaching concepts to the nuts and bolts of how would I actually do this? Like I was sitting here thinking, 
okay, if I was going to design a PBL or a TBL, like what exactly, what are the steps I would need to go through? And maybe I'm just not seeing the right sessions, but I feel like that maybe sometimes feels like a little bit of a gap is I love these ideas. I just don't know necessarily know how to like build something that implements these ideas. Yeah, and obviously I won't like fully answer that right now, but in the slide deck, um, and let me grab that right now and put it in the chat. I can also, um, it'll also be in the resources that we build for this session. So we'll be posting it online. Um, but if you keep going after the end, um, you will get to this resources and works cited section. And these, these things are pretty stellar. So, and actually it's gonna be in the, um, the notes of the slide deck. Let's see if I can show you that here. I don't think it's gonna let me, but in the notes of the slide deck, you'll be able to click on these links, um, the ones that are hot links. So for example, in this one, um, off to on best practices for online team-based team learning, it really talks about how to set this up if you were gonna try it on Zoom, right? Or an online environment. Um, some of these are evidence-based things, but I also wanna show you, not there. Sorry. Oh, you know where it is? It's um, if you go back to the beginning, um, these slides here have um, in the in the bottom part, they have, oh, it's going to click. Look. Oh, no, it's not going to click. It's because of how I'm sharing my screen and it doesn't let me get out of it. But if you click on it when I when you get the slide deck, um, you will see some pretty awesome resources that are much more about those, like, like kind of how to walk through rubrics. So it talks about what makes a good set of preparations. What do the IRATs look like? You know, what the, so um, in those sections, I think you'll see a little bit more um, that will help you with the planning. Um, so these talk about like, what are the best, like, what does a mini lecture look like? How do they make an appeal? So I think you'll find a little bit of that in the slide deck. Um, you know, maybe not all that you want, but um, two of the articles in particular are very instrumental about walking you through the steps. Um, the other thing I would say though, is that TBL, you know, it, it really is connected a lot of times to the healthcare fields and to clinicals. Um, and it's very strong about what it thinks is the best way to work through it. Um, and when you're adjusting that for different fields, I think you should feel empowered to, to change it up a little bit um, because you will I think to a certain degree, Jen, when you look at this stuff, you'll be like, actually, that's more direction than I wanted. So I think don't hesitate to mix it up a little bit if it doesn't work quite as well for your, for your group. In particular, I think how you handle this process of the team readiness, how do they prove their team's readiness? Because um, they have a whole thing about, they take the assessment, they can appeal it, you give the immediate feedback, and I think you can design that a lot the way you've normally designed feedback around group work in your own disciplines. But take a look at those. Um, I'm gonna put together the resource as soon as the recording's done and I'll post that. It'll have the slide deck and this recording next to each other. So that might help a little, but. Great, thank you, Robin. And Robin, I'll send you, you probably already have it, but it, just in case I have a really good, you know, how-to book on TBL. Um, that I ordered a couple copies of, but I'll send it, I'll send you the info. You can include it if it's not already in your resource list. That was what we used when we first started uh, setting ours up. And it, is, it does have a ton of structure, which appealed to me <laughs> as an instructor. I wanted to have the, the structure, but yeah, it's, uh, you certainly can adapt. Yeah, Cause there's a lot of plan, like this is, yeah. this is probably more, you know, if, with students, it's so ironic, right? That they're like, why aren't you teaching me? And this probably takes twice as much setup as going yeah. in, right? And doing your classic thing. Um, so I'll, I can get the name of that book too. Cause we also have a collab lending library. So we can get a copy of that and pop it in there for you to check out um, too, Jen, if that helps or others. Um, 
Okay, well, with that, um, I am going to head off unless anybody has any other things. All right, um, Barb, I have made you the host in case you need a few minutes, but for those Thank of you. you who are not in a faculty meeting right now, um, <laughs> that's the end of our session. Thanks so much, guys. Thank Bye. you, Robin. All right. We'll just pick up and do our, our a little bit of a faculty meeting here for PT. She, Robin oh, turned okay. to host. <laughs> I wasn't sure you if this join was us if you want. You're gonna hang out if you yeah. want. <laughs> of this no. I'm good, I have other things I can do. Thank I'm you, sure guys. you have other things you could do. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Th thanks. <laughs> All right, I was trying to figure out how to be subtle about that. I don't know if you realize this, but it's still recording. I don't know how that happened if she left.